Welcome to this episode with Annie Michon. Just a bit of background for you. Annie is a former inter uh, MI5 intelligence officer turned whistleblower. And at the start of this interview, we talk about a documentary called The Mole, which is currently on BBC iPlayer. It's an incredible documentary and it's about a citizen that tries and ultimately does successfully infiltrate North Korea to buy arms and drugs off them. Um, all with um, secret camera footage. It's an incredible documentary and Annie was part of that documentary to debrief the mole um, from for his findings ultimately from North Korea. So we talk about that at the start. We ultimately obviously talk about um, what it was like within the MI5 intelligence agency, what Annie did within the MI5 intelligence agency, what it was like uh, going on the run after she whistled blew a number of wrongdoings within the intelligence agency. We talk about um, big tech as well and how big tech are uh, abusing privacy um, and how governments have got um, backdoor access um, through big tech to ultimately grab uh, data from us and um, invade our privacy. We also talk about um, some key big whistleblowers like Edward Snowden, um, Julian Assange, we talk about WikiLeaks as well, and it's an incredible um, interview. So hope you enjoy this episode and uh, we'll see you next time. Welcome to the Leggett Podcast. This episode is kindly sponsored by Feel Supreme. We've uh, They've kindly been sponsors for the last number of episodes and they've got some incredible um, supplements and health products. I'm currently taking the CBD 500 milligram. Um, it's amazing. I can't um, say and stress how much it's helped me with sleep, uh, which is a massive big problem for me. Um, but they've got a number of different supplements as well that they want to push. Uh, vitamin C, D3, um, vitamin D is obviously brilliant to help with uh, immunity at the moment, which is um, certainly a topical um topical area if you like so if you go to the link which we've included below which is feelsupreme.co.uk forward slash leg it you can purchase all of their products through that link and please make sure you go and click it click through that link because it basically shows that uh, we have sent you the leg it podcast has sent you so again massive thanks to feel supreme huge huge amount amount of different products that they've got on offer as well um, and like I said, can't stress the CBD enough and the vitamin D3 as well. So hope you enjoy this episode and uh, we'll see you soon. Please don't forget as well to support us on Patreon. Basically, Patreon's like a private members area, if you like, for the Leggett podcast. And it gives you access to all previous episodes. It also gives you early access to all our episodes um, as soon as we record them pretty much. Uh, and we're also pushing out some more exclusive content that will be only available for people uh, who support us on Patreon. So if you go to patreon.com forward slash Leggett podcast, uh, then you can help support the podcast over there. If you do enjoy the episodes that we do, you know, we do one episode per week and um, then it's a great way of showing your support for us. Um, you guys have helped us very kindly uh, lease an office, an office space, a studio space where we're going to um, be taking the Leggett podcast to the next level and you can help support us uh, on Patreon. So massive thanks to everyone who's done that as well. Right, um, Annie Mashon, thank you so much for um, coming on the Leggett podcast. I said to you before we hit record that um, I found out about you through the most incredible documentary that I've ever I've ever watched called The Mole, um, which Andy, I think you watched the other day. I watched, I think earlier on in the week and it was just, for anyone who hasn't watched it, could you possibly just give a little overview and brief about what The Mole is? Because it's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> well, it's difficult to describe really. Um, it's, it, I would tend to agree it's probably one of the most bonkers projects I've ever been involved in, which considering my personal history is quite saying something. Um, so it's basically a story of a Danish citizen who decides that he wants to do something for the good of society. Um, for his own personal reasons, he decides to join the uh, Friends of the Democratic Republic of North Korea um, in his home country of Denmark. And he progresses up the ranks over the years until he's put in contact with the head of this organization, a guy called Alejandro de Benios, I think, a rather sinister Spaniard. 
Um, and he's taken by Alejandro to North Korea, introduced to all the bigwigs, honored as a friend of North Korea from the West, and then approaches this filmmaker, Mads Brugger, who had already made a film very critical of North Korea, a fellow Dane. And he says, I've got this story, I've got this infiltration possible of North Korea. Would you like to make a film with me? And that's how it started. So Mads was very enthusiastic about this. Um, and it sort of spiraled a bit way beyond even what he thought would be his control in terms of how the story progressed. Because he um, got the mole more and more involved in these um, undercover work. And then the North Koreans and Alejandro started putting out lures saying we may have, you know, we need investment for various business propositions and things. And at this point, they brought in a, a role player, um, an international man of mystery, a billionaire, allegedly, who would be interested in investing in North Korea for all sorts of nefarious reasons. Uh, this man was um, called in the film Mr. James, but his backstory is actually just as interesting as his fake identity because he used to be an international cocaine dealer um, in Denmark a real high roller. He was caught, he went to prison, he'd served his time and he was out and he was a bit bored. So he decided to join in this project and pose as this international man and go in and offer the North Koreans millions of euros to invest in their country. Um, and so it sort of began to spiral into ever crazier circles where he, Mr. James and the mole went to North Korea, were welcomed as honored guests, um, they were even given lists of arms that they could buy. It was like a sort of, you know, menu of high caliber weaponry. Um, and they signed a contract of understanding. Then it was discussed that how do you move all this stuff around behind the screen of UN sanctions? Because of course, North Korea is controlled by UN sanctions very tightly. So this is where we get the triangulation, where Mr. James would then buy an island in Lake Victoria in Uganda, boot off all the inhabitants build what would apparently be a tourist resort um, and un there would be an underground Bon Vadi lair underneath this tourist resort which would be a factory to man manufacture methamphetamine um, the drug for international drug trade and then the further triangulation is um, they then talk to a dodgy Lebanese um, oil broker who a ship broker who can transport ships with oil and break the embargo against North Korea. So by using this sort of three-pointed approach, you can smuggle arms, drugs, and oil into a highly sanctioned country, all under the noses of what is supposed to be the UN hawks are trying to stop these sort of deals going ahead. Um, so I don't think even Mads, when he first started working with the mole, thought that this would spiral into this sort of level of high finance, international chicanery. <laughs> I mean, it was like watching, um, you know, the John le Carre adaptation, The Night Manager, dodgy arms deals and things, but to the max, and this was all real. And these two guys were putting their lives on the line when they went into North Korea. Um, yeah, I, well, I think if you it remember... was, Ulrich was, in, is it Ulrich? He was incredibly brave, un, 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 unbelievable. Mm -hmm. yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. And also, I think a few years ago, there was that case of the um, US student who went over as a tourist, and I think nicked a flag or something. And he was caught and prosecuted to the nth degree by the North Korean regime. And sent to the gulags, tortured. Yeah. Mm -mm. And um, he came back home. Finally, he was released and he was a broken man and died soon afterwards. So those are the stakes you're operating against when you try and infiltrate the North Korean regime. And this is what these two people went in to do. And there was one point in the film where they've been doing all the tourist stuff in Pyongyang. And then um, one night they're told, well, we're going to dinner. And they get taken to this remote, rundown industrial estate and taken down into a cellar. And at that moment, they both think they're going to be shot or worse. And it turns out there's this sort of massive, luxurious restaurant lurking underneath this industrial wasteland where they were treated to the highest honours. And that's where they signed the contract of understanding for the arms deal. So there were moments, um, talking to them both when we were making this film, they, there were moments where they both thought they weren't get, going to get out. Um, you know, it, it would probably be not be death. It would probably be something like the gulags or something. Mm -hmm. And yet they continued doing it. They continued brazing it out. It's, a, it's just an absolutely mad film. And I said yeah. on the record saying, this is probably one of the most impressive private intelligence operations I've ever witnessed. It was astonishing. And I suppose that the, the difficulty is, and I think the person who made the film and maybe even yourself mentioned it is, is so like when does it end when do you when do you think right enough's enough here to actually I, say yeah. you know like let's call it quits now you we, we've got what we've you know came here to get to some extent mm. no i know mads um was tempted just to keep it running just to see one more he could get one yeah. more he could get 
But I think, yeah, that was enough. Um, mm. And it exposed the international machinations of how countries avoid UN sanctions and things like that. So I think, you know, he did get a story with that and he was very happy with it. Um, I'm sure Mr. James would have carried on as long as he could because he was a complete adrenaline junkie. I mean, he <laughs> said, this is why I'm doing this. I love this. It's exciting. Um, but I think Ulrich had really felt he'd run his course and he wanted to try and get back to normal family life, if that's ever possible, after doing Honestly, something like anyone, this. Uh, anyone who's not seen it, they, you need to go and watch it. It's absolutely incredible. And yeah. your and your role within that documentary, and obviously you know, <clears throat> the, the title to this is, of it. you know, obviously, you know, you, you were in the MI5, you were you were part of that intelligence agency group and then you obviously blew the whistle on a number of crimes that was happening but that you within that documentary you were there to debrief those two individuals and so i suppose the question i'm trying to answer ask ask yourself here is that debriefing section is is that an element to understand well is it two parts is it to find out exactly what was going on but also is it to find out the sort of mental stability, if you like, of those two individuals after this has happened? Mm. Um, yes, pretty much both. Um, and also to see perhaps if they were trying to pull the wool over our eyes, you know, and find out what their motivation is. I, it, I was brought in because of my, my background um, as an MI5 officer. And I had years ago, long time ago, debriefed occasionally some agents and things. So this was more of a, should we say, a journalistic debrief because there were certain narratives that needed to be pulled together to tell the story, which was, you know, very fragmented and very difficult to try and wrap your head around. Um, but if you're doing it as an intelligence officer properly, you, you, one, you want to sift the source, see if they are telling the truth, see if they're concealing stuff that you might need to know, or, you know, they're, they're trying to big themselves up and get more money out of you, usually as the organisation. Um, and then you want to try and usually try and get as much extraneous detail as possible because that's where often there can be cross references and you get the little nuggets of intelligence that lead on to other avenues of investigation. So it's like doing a big jigsaw puzzle um, as an intelligence officer. So this was slightly different because we were very much focused on drawing the narrative together to make it comprehensible. Because looking at it, when I first saw the material, it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> How does this all hang together? <laughs> so there was a slight difference, yeah. Um, and so you want to sift their reliability, um, you want to cross-reference the information they're giving you against other information you already, already have, um, and then decide how to take it forward. Mm. So this was very much more a sort of um, journalistic debrief. And I think it was also slightly confessional when sources or moles have been operating alone for a long period of time, just to suddenly be able to unburden themselves and say, oh, and I did this and I did that, and this happened, and this is where I was most scared, and I pulled this off, this is great. Um, is actually very important psychologically when you're coming to the end of a project like that. And I think the journalists recognise really, that too. Really therapeutic as well for the guys to be able to open up to you. Yes, yes. I mean, especially for Ulrich after 10 years of doing this um, and not being able to talk to anyone about it um, for many, many years. And he hadn't even told his wife until the end of the programme. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it is very important psychologically for people to have the chance to do that. So when did you first... Um, join MI5 then, Annie? Oh, um, almost 30 years ago. <laughs> it's right. a long time ago. Uh, yeah, I was recruited during 1990 and um, ended up starting to work there in January 1991. Right. Sounds so, it's so cool in itself. I, I was recruited. How does someone, does, is it a kind of a tap on the shoulder and say, you know, we've been watching you? Do you know, <laughs> how does that work? Uh, well, it did very much back in those days, um, but there are other avenues as well. Um, I actually applied to the Foreign Office because I wanted to be a diplomat and um, had a letter from the Ministry of Defence saying we may have other jobs you'd find more interesting. And at that point, um, when I opened the letter, I said in my usual ladylike way, oh, fuck, it's MI5. <laughs> <laughs> Just an instinctive reaction. I don't know why. Um, and I was going to ignore it because back then, I mean, after the 1980s with the uh, minor strike scandals and the whistleblowing scandals like Peter Wright and Spycatcher and Kathy Master and all the rest of it. MI5 had a really bad reputation. I was going to ignore, um, but my father encouraged me to phone up and 10 months later I was recruited. So. And was this just based on your CV or your kind of what, what you'd done beforehand? What was what given them the kind of inclination to think that you'd be better suited for MI5 rather than the life of a, diplom of a diplomat? I have no idea. Um, I mean, I, re I read classics at Cambridge. So, you know, that is classic, you know, civil service fodder and Whitehall fodder, isn't it? Um, which is why I applied to the Foreign Office, because um, I've, you know, 
had quite a lot of languages back in those days and I quite fancied that job. Um, I don't know, a lot of classicists ended up in MI5 and MI6 as well. I can postulate that it's a very broad discipline when you, you're doing very logical languages, but then you're doing all the literature and the philosophy and the history and the politics and the rhetoric and all the rest, rest of it as well, um, which might be helpful. Um, but MI5 even then was beginning to open up its recruitment. So they were also beginning to put um, anonymous um, articles in newspapers saying, you know, if you're interested in jobs and current affairs and things like that, would you like to have an interview with us? And that actually sounded like journalism for most people. And a lot of journalist types applied, therefore. And that's how I met my former partner, David Shaler, um, who actually applied through one of those adverts because he was a journalist and he wanted to get another job. Um, and he ended up in MI5 too. So it's a, it's a weird um, environment. I know they have massively diversified their recruitment profile since then. Um, so, you know, they are trying to do good in that sense. And also they are, have, I think, been awarded um, uh, best employer of um, LBGT and people like that for the last few years in the UK. So they have definitely sort of democratised and opened up and broadened out their perspective since 30 mm. years ago. And what, what specifically did you, so what, what, I mean, it's such a broad question, like what, what was your role within MI5? And obviously, you know, as someone who's never obviously not been in it, you know, I, I think sort of there's two categories here. There's obviously MI6, which I, which I think is called SIS, is it now? Or, yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Which, which I, I. Well, what, what is the difference, sorry, so I don't know, the, between MI5 and MI6? Okay. Um, so we've got MI6, which is the Secret Intelligence Service, which is the James Bond branch of British intelligence, or they like to think so anyway. So they're the ones who, um, their job is to go abroad and um, get information and intelligence in countries of interest. They often work under diplomatic cover, but they can have other covers as well. So their job is basically intel intelligence gathering, which they then take back to London and it gets assessed there. MI5, um, or the Security Service, as it's commonly known, um, is there to protect national security. So they started off uh, working on counter espionage and then that evolved into counter subversion during the Cold War, looking for reds under the bed, problematic issue. And then in the 1990s, they took on the lead investigation of the provisional IRA in the UK uh, for the first time. And then of course, Al Qaeda and the war on terror took off. So they have the lead in terrorist um, investigations in the UK. But I would suggest that the setup is a very British model because these have all evolved over the last hundred years. So we have MI6, MI5, and also we have GCHQ, the government communications headquarters, which is our electronic snooping agency based down in Cheltenham. It's like the NSA in America. Um, and people have always said historically, MI5 is like the FBI, MI6 is like the CIA and GCHQ is the NSA. But in the UK, we have a newer agency called the National Crime Agency, which is indeed the UK's FBI. Um, they have the power of arrest, which MI5 doesn't. So MI5 is sort of left out on a bit of a limb at the moment, sort of historic anachronism, um, justifying itself by doing counter-terrorism work when it was actually set up primarily to do counter-espionage work. And now, of course, we've got, the, you know, all this flap about Russia and China and espionage and counter-espionage. And they don't have the, um, from what I can see, the manpower to do that as well as trying to counter war on terror. So I think there will be some sort of recalibration between those four agencies probably looming in the near future. We're certainly seeing a recalibration in the laws that govern those agencies because they're tightening up all the powers um, to protect the agencies and also massively expanding all the powers to snoop on us. It's a bit like a power grab going on legally at the moment behind the scenes. Mm. Yeah, I, I know there's, a, there's, I mean, there's so much that has come out around, you know, from an outsider, it seems like all these agencies hide behind the Official Secrets Act and you know that that's you know certainly massive with Ed, Edward Snowden. I think in in some of the interviews I've seen on about the NSA and obviously you, you know my personal opinion is is he he genuinely tried to do the best thing I think for for the US and you know try to expose some of the potential wrongdoings. But again, mm. there's there's very little I think that can come out. Can is that because of this Official Secrets Act or whatever it is in the the version that's in the US is that ah. all these organisations <laughs> hide behind. Well, the US doesn't have an official secrets act. Um, sorry, I'm going to be boringly legal just for a minute. So the UK has got the 1911 official secrets act, which is there to stop treachery. And it's got the 1989 official secrets act, which is there to stop whistleblowers. Um, and they are reviewing those laws at the moment to try and tighten them up and increase the legal penalty for whistleblowers and journalists. So at the moment, those people would face two years in prison 
for blowing the whistle or reporting it. What they want to do is ramp that up to 14 years in prison for journalists and whistleblowers, which is in line with what people used to get for treachery under the 1911 Act. However, what they want to do is now amal amalgamate this into what they're going to call the Espionage Act, um, which is going to be a nasty one. The US has never had any official secrets laws, but they have had something called the Espionage Act 1917, which is there again to stop treachery. But that has been used time and time and time again over the last 20 years to suppress whistleblowers. And that is the law that they are using against Julian Assange, a publisher at the moment, or they want to use. Um, and that is an invidious act too. And we've seen whistleblower after whistleblower being threatened with this law, which means that they face 35 years in prison if found guilty. We've had Tom Drake coming out of the NSA. We've had um, Bill Binney, the former technical director of the NSA, um, was also threatened with the Espionage Act in America and a couple of their colleagues as well. So um, the laws, um, particularly in America and the UK, have been uh, the most, I would just say the agencies in, in America and the UK, but particularly the UK, have been the most um, legally protected and the least legally accountable in any Western country um, over the last century. And they're trying to make them even more protected now. So the question is, what are they trying to hide? And usually it's trying to stop whistleblowing. I was going to um, say, that's, I mean, just as a civilian now, that's the first thing that springs to mind. You know, when they're trying to bump up these prison sentences, it's like, why, why are you doing that? Quite. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's just to stop others. I mean, you know, it's, it's the fear of deterrence, isn't it? Mm. And, 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 you know, I think some of the things that have come out of WikiLeaks, you know, I, I, I first heard of WikiLeaks when that, sort of infamous video came out of um, the US soldiers in a helicopter that were, yeah. got, I think there was a Reuters photographer there. There was, um, a, 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 anyway, they were all journalists, I believe, weren't they? And they were shooting that minibus. And obviously, you know, the, the transcripts and their, their voice actually came out of what they were saying and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as, as an outsider, as someone, obviously we've, we've all got a conscience, you know, we'd think that, that those sort of, crimes you know should be celebrated and yet i know yeah <laughs> you know to, to it was think a war that, crime yeah we, exactly it was a war crime and to think that that isn't encouraged that you know to to whether it's to get those sort of people out of the military or whether it's to change certain things or whether it's to change rules of, rules of engagement i don't know obviously i haven't served in a war so i don't know but you know to, to change that should be the the you know the encouragement it shouldn't be for the 14 years of you know the deterrent shouldn't be there for you know mm -hmm, there needs to be mm -hmm. this avenue doesn't there that but mm -hmm. it's a difficult balancing act i feel obviously because especially with other organizations involved i think absolutely i mean if you've got people in the armed services putting their lives on the line they need to be able to respond and protect themselves um and respond very fast but i think um what was particularly disgusting about the collateral murder was the way that the um, this, it was like a snuff video. They were gloating, the people shooting up these people on the ground. And some of them were obviously children. Um, they always claimed they thought that the Reuters cameraman, um, his tripod was a, you know, a launcher or something. So they had to do it. But it was the gloating that was disgusting. And also one of the things that is often forgotten about that is that from, I think it was 2005 when it happened, the Reuters family members were pushing the Pentagon in America for full disclosure, what happened to our relatives? We want to know the truth of how they died. And they were lied to. And they were lied to until that collateral murder came out. So it's only because of WikiLeaks that the, the relatives of the, fam, you know, the family members of the people who were murdered that day actually found out they had been lied to by their government and they'd been covered up. So I think you know, it's not just the actual event itself, which was horrible and shocking and gloating and disgusting, but it's also the fact that absent WikiLeaks, those family members would never have known what had happened to their loved ones. Yeah, it's a tough one, I think, when, um, I mean, things like that are obviously completely wrong and disgusting. What I always found really interesting from being in Afghanistan, it was the, it, it was the laws that you have to abide to, you know, mm -hmm. the rules of engagement. So there'd be a case where, and again, I'm not 100% certain on this, but it was along the lines of, you know, you could be standing there, 10 guys, you know, shooting at the Taliban and the Taliban are shooting at you. You know, this Taliban could shoot nine of your friends mm -hmm. to you. His, the Taliban's weapon might jam. And then he quickly drops the weapon and puts his hand up and says, okay, you know, I'm sorry. And you're standing there, nine of your friends are, are dead now. You've then under the kind of the 
laws of uh, engagement, then have to just go and arrest them and then hand them over to the national, uh, the Afghan National Army, which are very corrupt and can be bought off, etc. And I think it's very difficult to then ask a guy who's just seen nine of his friends murdered to say, okay, I'm going to follow the Geneva Code and I'm going to hand him over, knowing that 48 hours later he's going to be back fighting again. And mm. so I think it becomes very, very grey very quickly. But obviously that's a lot different than what we were talking about then. But it's it's just such a muddle when it comes to war. And, and, and Absolutely. I mean, I have no no experience frontline action at all, nothing. Um, and I can understand exactly how difficult it can be and how grey these issues can be. And um, I have watched with horror um, the fake prosecutions and persecutions of servicemen. Mm. You know, they've been pursued through the courts in the UK. And they were just trying to, as you say, deal with the situation, try and survive, try and protect their, their comrades in arms. Um, so, yes, it is a, it is a grey area. I think the thing about the collateral murder video, though, is the absolute overt gloating. Yeah. It's like watching two teenage boys playing a snuff video game or something. And what culture creates that mentality and, and we've seen this from other whistleblowers coming out of the drone warfare sections as well saying you know this is encouraged and it, it's just so remote there's no human interaction whereas of course in a with heat of battle yeah. with your comrades that's mm. a very different pr perspective i think um and yeah it's a it's a murky world but yeah it was really strange at times when i worked with the americans and i'm not saying it's all americans but they were very like woo. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. No, it's after the war on terror started. You know, they've never been struck in their homeland in that way before with 9-11. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all, all the posturing and the, the rush to war and the fact that they said the uh, intelligence gloves had come off, basically meaning, you know, torture, kidnapping, rendition, all the rest of it. It spiralled very darkly and very quickly into a nasty place, I think, with the Americans. Mm -hmm. um, Annie, just going back to... Um... Um, when you're in the MI5 then so what sort of and obviously I, I imagine there's there's um, rules around what you can talk about but what exactly were you involved in or as, a, as an overview then well I can talk about what was clear for my book so <laughs> yeah at the moment yeah um, yeah I was recruited as a general intelligence officer which basically means that you um, are posted to a desk as they call it, it sounds really exciting which is a subject area um, for two years and moved on and you have to investigate the target, um, be it a country or a part of a terrorist organization or a political group or whatever it is. And then you have a, an array of secret ways of investigating those people, like you know, getting them followed around or bugging their homes or bugging their communications or whatever it is. So you have to basically manage that operation. So you go out and you get those resources, you put them in place, you get all the information coming back and then you have to make a judgment, is this worth pursuing? Does this need action? Is a bomb about to go off? Do we need to get the police to go and arrest these people? Or is it nothing of interest? Let's park it. So it's basically deploying the resources, getting the information in, assessing it, and then they're taking the action and closing it down or following up the operation. So that's what an intelligence officer does effectively. Um, and I'm sure it's not much different to this day, apart from mm. the fact they've got much more tech to play with, which makes life a lot more easy. Um, and the areas I worked on were political subversion, which was reds under the bed, which they told me they had stopped doing. So that was a bit of a shock. And that was um, awful. Could you just explain what reds under the bed mean? Oh, this is from the old uh, Cold War thing, you know, like the McCarthy witch trials and things in the 50s in America. In um, the UK, in the 1950s and 60s, there, were, there was a very notorious spy ring called the Cambridge Five that was outed. This is uh, Burgess, Philby, McLean. Um, couple of others whose name was Cain Cross and um, one other. Um, and this was basically an infiltration by the Soviet Union into the upper echelons of British society, getting these young men to become communists and then infiltrate the establishment and report back. And they were very successful spiring, but they were outed and they fled to Russia. So then there was this absolute paranoid spasm on the part of the British establishment in the 1960s onwards about um, possible infiltration, i.e. subversion, by the Soviet state or other communist states infiltrating the UK and its establishments. And this sort of spiral, spiraled out of control. So a whole section was set up to look at um, fellow UK citizens for potentially communist or Trotskyist affiliations. So you have these tiny little communist groups or Trotskyist groups, you know, a few hundred or a thousand max, being massively surveyed by MI5 in case they might be subverting the UK state. Um, and this really reached its sort of apotheosis in the 1980s um, because there was, uh, it's a long time ago now, but 
uh, there was a big fight in the Labour Party between the more moderate wing and the militant tendency, which is an entryist Trotskyist group that wanted to take it far left. So it's a bit like watching what's going on with the convulsions between the Corbynites and the more mainstream Labour Party at the moment. Happening a lot in Liverpool, all that talk. <laughs> oh God, Degsy Hatton, of course, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, he was one of the top top people being investigated. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, but I think a lot of people in Liverpool are real Corbynites, and then you see on Twitter they're all going. Uh, it's all a bit messy now. It is very messy. Well, it was messy in the eighties as well. So, but this gave MI five the excuse to um, to survey and investigate hundreds of thousands of UK citizens purely for their political beliefs. Um, which was completely disproportionate. That was the problem. And in fact, it also meant that they had files held on most of the Labour government, you know, who were elected in 1997, had been involved in more left-wing politics when they were younger. And they all had files held on them. So we had a situation in the late 1990s where the Home Secretary, who is notionally the political master of MI5, um, Jack Straw, knew he had a file held on him by MI5. A ditto with um, Robin Cook, who was the head of MI6, that, he was the foreign secretary. And it just went on. Most of Blair's cabinet had files held on them by MI5, and they knew it because of what Shayla disclosed. So in terms of a democratic balance, it's very much the tail wagging the dog, because they're going to be very worried about what MI5 knows about them. They don't know what they know. Mm. So all their dirty little secrets, you know, are going to be in the back of their heads, making them paranoid. It was a crazy situation. So that was, that was the first big disillusionment, shall we say, that I had with MI5. And and that infiltrating political um, political parties, then it, that's across all spectrums. That's you know across Labour government, Tory, whoever it is. Are they just trying to? That's what I can, I'm trying to get my head wrap around. Is are they just trying to get as much information about people within government or within political parties as they can to eventually? I, 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 like what, I, what's the end game with it? Knowledge is power. That's the end game. Mm. The more you have, the more you wield. Um, I don't know if they're doing the same thing now. I mean, the, the subversion section, and I practice it, I did help do this, um, did shut down in the mid-1990s. Um, and largely the information held on the politicians in the 1990s was legacy from the 70s and 80s when, you know, Tony Blair was a bit left wing and things like that. It's hard to imagine now, isn't it? Um, and Peter Mandelson and people like that, Harriet Harman, all the rest of them. Um, even I saw recently, actually, I was reading Private Eye and actually fell off my chair. There was a woman called Claire Fox, who was a very hardcore revolutionary Communist Party member back in the 1990s still. And she's just been made Baroness Fox. I was like, how did that happen? <laughs> I mean, for her rather than the state. But so this, this area of, of investigation was shut down in the 1990s. And uh, left wing activists, um, environmental activists, animal activists, those sort of investigations, then moved on to the Metropolitan Police. And that's where we get to the undercover cop scandal, you know, with all these guys operate as policemen operating undercover, fathering children. However, looking at reading the runes and looking at how the new law is being put in place, it sounds like they are beginning again to look at what they would call domestic extremists, which doesn't necessarily mean left wing or white, right wing, but it's probably going to fall under the purview of MI5 again. And that means investigating their fellow UK citizens for their political beliefs, which is a tricky one in a democracy. You know, unless you're actually expressing a violent desire to overthrow the state or to harm your fellow citizens, cause violence, I can't see any political actions should be impeded by secret, um, mm. the secret state. Was there a point, Annie, when you first kind of, you know, got into MI5 and you're learning about all these new roles and what's going on in the political agenda and all the different roles? where you kind of thought, wow, okay. I'm just thinking, because when I, when I joined the Marines, a large proportion of special forces are made up from mm. uh, Marines. So we ended up getting a presentation one day from the guys um, in special forces. And they kind of said, you know, special forces are operating in X amount of countries right now. And you kind of think, oh, well, yeah, they, they might be there and they might be there. But then you're like, fucking hell, I didn't know they were in that many places. And you think, mm. wow. Was there a bit of you when you first joined thought, well, I knew they'd probably do this and that, but wow, <laughs> I didn't think this. Bit, yeah, yeah. Did you ever apply to the special services? No, I've got a lot of friends who are currently now in. It's something I would definitely have loved to have tried. Who knows whether I would have made the cup, but um, I was injured before I got the chance to, oh. but something I would have loved to have. I've got, like I say, a lot of friends who are doing it right now. and um, But yeah, I just, I just found it fascinating to think that. I mean, I knew being in the Marines was... was 
kind of on on this, you know, the same uh, the same ladder, if you like, just a bit further down the rung. But it was just a real eye opener, even just to get a little insight and a little, you know, absolutely. Glimpse. No, I mean they they do a phenomenal job. As you know, the military is, is, I think the UK should be proud rather than cutting it back. Yeah, massively. Yeah, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, what well, one thing that always surprised me is is how um, you know sometimes things go wrong like they do in every walk of life. But it always used to surprise me how much just how often we get it right when so many moving parts, especially in the military, especially the special forces, and there's so many moving parts, and it always seems to get the light shone on when something goes wrong. But but the only amount of things that go on, it could mm-hmm. go wrong a lot more than it does. Believe me. Mm. Yeah. No, lines led by donkeys is the usual phrase, isn't it? <laughs> have you come across um, uh, an organisation called Veterans for Peace? I haven't known. Oh, have a look. It's um, it was set up. In, well, it's an it's a UK version of an American thing, um, which was set up by Ben Griffin. He was the SAS guy who refused to serve in Iraq because he said the war was illegal. So oh, he'd right. served all over and done all sorts of stuff. So they couldn't say, "Oh, you're being a coward." Mm. Um, but yeah, they were trying to get him, but he sort of fought back and. Yeah, he's quite outspoken, very good activist, very interesting organisation. Yeah. I think when you say about, when you just say then, Andy, about how many places, I think there was a few years ago, there was somewhere in Africa uh, that you hear about these things when uh, a guy just runs into a hotel, pretty much a Western mm-hmm. hotel and, and, and storms it. Um, and there was an, uh, an SAS or an SBS guy who was who happened to have been there in I think it might have been Namibia or one of those sort of and you think well why <laughs> like you just said well why is he there you know and and he, and he was you know mm. and he and he, he did uh, there, I remember there was a, a famous photo take obviously his his face was blurred out and uh, he was going into the into the hotel alone um, but is yeah it's but anywhere you can then think where you have to then maybe take a step back and look at your life and think right before I step into this. Do I know what I'm getting myself in for? <laughs> well, like the guy in Africa. Um, actually, I just want to pick up on that before I, I pick up on what you just mentioned, because there was a story recently. I remember the story. The SAS guy was there training local forces. Yes, specialist that was it. Techniques. Yeah. And he went in and saved a lot of lives and got an award. And there was something in the newspaper only in the last month where he's actually resigned or been drummed out of the SAS because everyone was envious of the fact he got all that kudos. They're all supposed to be in the shadows and secret and things. I don't know what the truth of the story is, but he's not there anymore, which right. is sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's um, interesting, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, in terms of is, is enough enough, um, obviously that guy felt it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what, what do, going back to, so you were in this, you were obviously within this sort of desk, if you like, Annie, within MI5. Did, and then did you move to another, you know, domestic terrorism and 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 that sort of thing did you move around a lot or did you yeah so every two years you change um so the first two years we're looking at subversion um mainly this s socialist workers party which you know they shouldn't have been investigating them anyway they went a threat they went a subversive threat and i made that argument um then i moved to what was called t branch and i was in charge of uh, irish terrorist logistics which is infiltration and exfiltration of material and, and personnel and people like that and then um, I moved to G Branch, um, looking at international terrorism. So yeah, I had three different postings and all three of them gave me a different perspective. And in all three sections, both David, Shayla and myself saw things going wrong. And it wasn't so much, okay, things go wrong. I mean, sometimes you, there is a clusterfuck and you know, something goes off and it shouldn't. I think the problem we had mainly was the fact that every time there was something like that, MI5 management would all, always tell us just to sort of shut up and not rock the boat, just follow orders. And they would lie to government about their mistakes and miss the opportunity to learn from those mistakes, to improve their work and to improve the way that they could protect. Um, so, yeah, it, it, there are a few things, um, bombs that went off that could have been, should have been prevented by um, the IRA in the UK in the mid 1990s. Um, there were two innocent people put on trial for an attack they did not commit. Um, there was an illegal phone tap on a high profile left wing journalist at the Guardian. And there was also the thing that was the thing that made us quit, which was uh, MI6 funding um, a branch of Al Qaeda in Libya in 1996 to try and assassinate Colonel Gaddafi. Um, so they paid the money. And this was a target one for MI5 was Al Qaeda even at that time. 
and it was an illegal operation under the terms of the law because they did not get prior written permission from the foreign secretary and it went wrong and it killed innocent people so that pretty much did that was the thing that sort of broke the straw on the camel's back and that's when we went we decided to go public and david went to the newspapers with this catalogue of of mistakes i mean we've i've always been very clear what we've talked about or what i continue to talk about has always been non-official secrets because they were criminal and they should have led to reform um and there's so much work that they do do that's very good that is always unreported which I, you know, I can't talk about either, but they do do a lot of very good work and stop a lot of terrorist attacks and things like that. But it's just when it goes bad, it goes bad very quickly um, and massively because it's all done in secret and can be kept in secret. And that's the key problem. At what point are you and your partner then when, you know, maybe you're going home together that night and something's went wrong and you're kind of looking at each other thinking, you know, this isn't, this isn't quite right, this. I mean, at what point did that start momentum building where you both kind of... Because I don't know, I imagine, was there a point where maybe you thought that you needed to say something but thought that maybe you couldn't confide in him or vice versa? Or was there an awkward bit where you think, actually, I need to say something? No, I think um, it, there were... There was a massive recruitment in 1990, 1991 because they were going to take on the terrorism work. Um, so there, there, were, there was a big group of us of the same sort of generation of intake and we were all concerned about a lot of these ethical issues. We we're all muttering about them. I mean, we socialised all the time. It was very sort of incestuous organisation because it's much easier if you can talk openly with your friends anywhere than if you have to sort of always pretend just to be a civil servant or something. Um, so there was a lot of discontent and there were record numbers of people leaving the year we left. Um, of our generation because they were equally disgusted but we had a particular freedom because I suppose um, we didn't have a mortgage we didn't have children um, we were free to take a more extreme path perhaps than other people would be able to do um, and also David had this sort of um, early taste of journalism so he sort of had he knew how the media worked so he thought okay we've taken it as far as we can on the inside um, we're being told to shut up you know, just follow orders let's take it outside then and take a risk and see what happens um which is what we did it was not an easy decision to take even then but um, it took quite a number of uh, long discussions but even so and, and annie did you you know did you have like a pack of papers or did you obviously i don't know if usb pen drives were, but we're back then or <laughs> no. you know did, 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 did was it just a case of look this is what's happening as in take my word for it as such no 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 dave um took a number of documents to prove what he was saying and um he then gave them to the newspaper that published the stories the newspaper was fairly timid timid though because they only started with the, the, the low level um subversion stories rather than starting with the Gaddafi plot which is the main reason we did what we did um, but David provided proof of all these sort of things over the years and um, they kept the documents. Dave and I went on the run because otherwise we sat on a flat, we'd have been you know, immediately banged up and held on remand for a year or two. Um, and then the police came knocking on the door of the newspaper and said, well, hand over the documents. So we lost the proof of what we were saying. But the journalists at that newspaper had seen the proof of what we were saying, which is why they then ran the stories. But yeah, it's... It's easier now, I think, if you, you get a little, like, you know, drive or whatever and take all the documents. Absolutely, if you can cover your traces like Edward Snowden. But it's also exponentially harder um, because of the way the surveillance state, um, you know, both corporate and spy, can track us everywhere if they want to. To mm. go on the run, it's really hard now. Mm. It's not impossible, and I, but... <laughs> and I imagine as well, is is more so even these days is, is I mean, it's such a, such a, like a snowball effect. It's like, are people even so if i worked within the organization are people even looking at me and it's like where you know that your head must just be i can't imagine what edward snowden must have been going through and the, the conversations he had and obviously you know you, yourselves both of you have, have obviously had similar conversations to to think you know what, what, you know am i doing the right thing should i do this yeah, should yeah, i not you know yeah. it's easy to just get a, get paid at the end of every month and then you know forget about gaddafi and some of the other things that, that happen, absolutely you know? And this is, I think, one of the aspects that most people ignore when we're talking about whistleblowing is that soul searching. And um, the, the, it's not just, you know, getting the paycheck at the end of the month, which is always nice, of course. I mean, I haven't had a paycheck at the end of the month since. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but it's also you know the upset it's going to cause your friends and your family particularly you know what they're going to go through um how upset they're going to be the fact that you not only lose your professional reputation but also any chance of future normal employment because what can companies ever going to employ a whistleblower they might do it to you right um so you lose pretty much everything as a whistleblower in any area i mean it could be finance it could be health we've seen this time and time again in the scandals with health whistleblowers having their careers destroyed but the specific added bonus the banker's bonus so to speak for intelligence and government and military is if you blow the whistle you'll probably end up in prison too so it's a huge step to take and it is never taken lightly and when i see whistleblowers now being dismissed in the mainstream media as oh they're just glory hunters they want the attention i it makes me angry really angry because these are journalists sitting there you know comfortably getting their end of month salary check usually and you know they're, they're casting aspersions on people who are usually motivated incredibly to do something they think they can't not do because mm. it'd be wrong not to do it it'd be wrong not to speak out despite the cost to themselves and to their families and to their friends and their professional reputation and everything yeah. else it's a huge huge step it takes a lot of thought and you mentioned you know um about the the media and and the media having spin on certain certain whistleblowers do you think that's the, the an element of that is security agencies intelligence agencies pushing that agenda towards Abs yeah. absolutely yes there's no doubt about it <laughs> yeah i mean i one of the things i i am um i've been doing a lot of talks i lecture at universities and you know conferences and companies and all the rest of it on a whole range of different issues but one of them is how the spies can manipulate the media it's not to say they do it all the time but there are certain easy ways for them to play the media particularly in the uk and the us um yes so it's very easy to do that and to damage a whistleblower's reputation just by is, that, is that simply just by spreading misinformation so sending so it could be sending a journalist a false story about you know or i'm, I'm surprised that you, even you and your partner didn't get discredited because you know, or some story came out, some falsification story came out about that, you know, oh, she didn't really work for MI5 or, you know, those sort of tactics that you'd think potentially would, would happen. Or... <laughs> well, I think there, there are, there is some stuff out there. It's a bit like, oh, Annie Masham was just an admin person. As if, well, what's wrong with being an admin person? I wasn't, I was an intelligence officer, but what's wrong with being an admin person? It's all this snooty UK stuff, isn't it? The class-based stuff. Um, but no, um, it's, it's more sophisticated. There, there are the legal powers that can be used to stifle what goes into the media. Uh, I think most notoriously we saw recently the Guardian having its hard disk smashed up around the Snowden disclosures, which was just theatre. I mean, you know, they're all over the place. So there are all sorts of laws that can be used against journalists, which are the, the stick bit. And there's the, the carrot bit, which is how they um, seduce journalists into a sort of secret charm circle of disclosure. Hey, you know. We used to be at university together come and have lunch and by the way i've got this story you might like and the journalist becomes you know a security journalist and then gets more stories and more scoops and it's all good for their career and all the rest of it and there are links between different stages you know the sort of the heads of mi5 and the editors of newspapers or the proprietors of newspapers or whatever it is um which is very seductive and it's very easy therefore to spin from the inside and even you know there are certainly in mi6 in the 1990s and i'm sure they still have it but they will have changed the name was a section called information operations which was a section there to plant exactly as you said fake stories and to manipulate stories which might be adversely um, commenting on the intelligence agencies mm. so there are people embedded in the newsrooms um, who report back and say oh, there might be a story breaking or something like that so it's all very very easy to manipulate the public perception then of course we have the internet this great wondrous thing where we can all get information it's all honest it's all free right and we know from the 1990s, from the Snowden disclosures, um, the Americans and the Brits decided they wanted to achieve something called total mastery of the internet. How frightening is that? This is one of the Snowden stories. And I they had the perfect- I love that one thing, doesn't it? Total mastery of the internet itself. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> so we get to a situation where um, the spies have pretty much backdoored all the major social media um, and tech giant corporations again this is all snowden prism tempera these are the programs you need to look at um they can access oh god i sound nuts but this again it is all from edward snowden's documents they can access pretty much any major tech corporation with backdoor technology whether the corporation knows it and agrees or doesn't 
um, they can hoover up all the transatlantic and fiber optic information between North America and Europe, and they do, and they keep it. Um, this is all utterly illegal, by the way, under all domestic, all different national laws. Um, and they, they've gone far beyond. And they've also got this program. This is another one that people should have a look at. This was a disclosure that came through WikiLeaks a few years ago called Vault 7. Vault 7, uh, yeah. Which is all about, it's a cache of CIA cyber weapons and vulnerabilities that they've been storing to allow the CIA to use at the future when it might suit them. Um, and this included programs, I think called Marble and Umbra were the two that stuck in my name, which allowed the CIA to hack something and make it look like it was either the Russians hacking or the Chinese hacking. So therefore, every time you see something coming up saying the Russians hacked this or the Chinese or the North Koreans or whatever, how do you know? Yeah. And there was another one as well. I, I'll just finish on this point is um, the NSA, the um, eavesdropping organization in the USA, had a similar breach and this fell into criminal hands a few years ago and was put on the black market by a criminal organization called the Shadow Brokers saying, we've got all these NSA cyber weapons, come and bid for them. And some of them have obviously gone into the wild because uh, do you remember the WannaCry hack? That, um, it was a ransomware that closed down a lot of NHS. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, about yeah, yeah. three, four years ago or something That's like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a few others have come out as well, and that came out of the NSA stash. So you have a situation where the spies and the corporates, corporations can work together to a certain extent, wittingly or unwittingly. You have a situation where the spies might not necessarily be able to protect their own cache of cyber weapons, so they go out into the wild and can mutate and fall into the hands of criminals. And we're all sitting here as sitting ducks on our computers, thinking, you know, hey, we live in the West, we're all protected, our spies are good, and, you know, they can protect us and all that sort of stuff. It's a mess out there behind the scenes, and trying to get that message out is pretty much what Edward Snowden and many other of the NSA whistleblowers have been trying to do too. I think I've told um, Tom the story. I, I remember I was in Afghanistan, and we raided the compound, and we found 10,000 US dollars in the corner of a room, and at that time, I was a young 20-year-old. I didn't even have 10,000 pounds, and I was a you know, British citizen, and yet there was some... Afghan living in the middle of nowhere with $10,000. We got this guy in for questioning and it turns out he was a US spy who'd been there for years. And I just kind of remember thinking that night, you know, how small am I in this little, in this chessboard? What's going on? It's like, this is, mm -hmm. and I kind of maybe went the other way, rightly or wrongly. I just thought, you know what? I'm here for six months. I'm trying to get my head down and crack on, you know, because I thought if my mind wanders into what he's doing how long he's been there what is the big objective is you you'd go crazy you know as yeah, a young yeah. 20 year old lad there and it was it's only as i get older now and i start to question a lot of the things and you think but well, why did we do that why did we go there and it's um yeah you can get a headache very quickly thinking, <laughs> thinking of just how big it goes yeah, yeah i know i know no I, I mean at the height of the afghan thing um the us was actually shipping in pallet loads of dollars billions of dollars went in to try and bribe, you know, the warlords or mm. leaders or whatever. And a lot of that money went into the pocket of the governments um, who were approved of by the US at that point. And then a lot of it went into their relatives' pockets who were then running the war and uh, they were running the drug trade out of Afghanistan. It's a lovely business cycle. <laughs> <laughs> the war on terror, the war on drugs, they keep funding each other, it's beautiful. So when you start pulling back, as you said, and thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, we're all just little cogs in this massive machine, and you pull back from you think, bloody hell, what can we do? It can be dispiriting, but it can also be um, very empowering in the sense that you meet up with like-minded people, you get involved in some sort of campaign or whatever it is, and your community builds and things like that. And I think mm. that's all we can do in the face of this rather grotesque power, <laughs> which we, we all have to deal with now. I, th I think the, the, the one thing that you talked about in the media before, and the one thing that always sticks out in my mind is, I think Edward Snowden came out in 2013. I think it would have been June 2013, I think. And I was actually in Turkey um, at the time. And, you know, when you're abroad, there's different news organizations that you usually wouldn't. So Al Jazeera, uh, Russia Today. And the, the complete disparity between what Russia Today was saying and to what BBC World Service was saying about an individual I mean, it's one of the reasons why I still follow Russia Today on on a number of, because I just enjoy the different opinions and they do really good documentaries a lot of the time. Mm. And that just difference between how a media organization that 
looks on an individual that way versus another one. It's just so insane that you yeah. can see it literally with your own eyes. And to think what else is going on underneath that yeah. must just yeah. be. No, yeah. I, it's, um, it is fascinating. And I've, I've always said to people when I've talked about media and they say, well, what do, what do you read? What do you believe? I swear I read as much as I can from all sides and try and formulate my own views. But you mentioned the, when Ed, the Edward Snowden story broke, um, he came out. Um, I was actually called up by RT that night. It was about midnight. And I was just, you know, about to take the, the makeup off and everything. And it's like, can you do an interview in five minutes? Ah, okay, what about? And they said, this guy's just come out. He's a whistleblower. Okay, great. So that was RT. Um, yeah. And then, there, I mean, I'll give you another example of disparity. Do you remember the Sergei Skripal case, you know, yeah. where the Skripals were poisoned? When that broke, I was invited onto RT again. I have been a regular, I will say this up front. I'm a regular, I have been a regular on many different TV channels, but I always get blamed for RT. So that night I was, I was called onto RT and then I was invited onto um, Newsnight. And I said exactly the same things in both interviews within about half an hour of each other. And the next day it's like, she's a conspiracy theorist, look at her on RT. And wow, she was really sort of, you know, moderate and, and asking people to pause for thought on BBC Newsnight, that was great. <laughs> And yes, I said exactly the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, 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 sorry, go on, Andy. Yeah, and you know, we're just on that, but the kind of spin of things and, and also linked to terrorism as well. What you said about the, uh, did you say about the, was it an IRA bombing, was it that could have been pre prevented? Did you say before? Yes, yeah. The Bishopsgate bombing in 90, Christ, when was it? Three, yeah. So, you know, when you think, you know, that could have been prevented and yet it's been let happen, is that when suppose just adds fuel to the fire of this conspiracy and they want this to happen because that will then lead to that to then lead to that you know does it frustrate you now when i don't know what your, your view is on conspiracy theorists but for me it's like well when you when you just start asking one question and then, and then it's linked to that then linked to that linked to that it's hard not to go down that rabbit hole isn't it mm -hmm. no believe me some of my best friends are conspiracy theorists <laughs> no i mean if you look deeply enough on the internet, you're going to find me talking about 9-11. I've worked with a number of, of key people um, over a couple of years um, who were questioning the evidence of 9-11 and saying, we're not saying, you know, some deep conspiracy, but we have these questions and we need proper answers because 9-11 has been used not only to wage wars across Central Asia, and, um, uh, but also because it's stripping away our civil liberties in our own home countries. I mean, particularly America with the Homeland Security Act, which was egregious. God. Um, so let's just ask a few questions. So, yeah, I, I've swum in those waters, but I've, it's always been the shallow end, should we say. And I did that partly because I could see how MI, uh, MI5 and MI6 were misusing the 9-11 war on terror narrative. And we saw that, you know, with the uh, fake intelligence that took us into war in Iraq and all the rest of it. But also because if you don't question, you don't get people standing up again and just saying, OK, we're not saying there's some massive global lizard conspiracy, but there are some unanswered questions coming from a lot of former intelligence officers, particularly in America, saying it could not, it should have been prevented. There was enough intelligence to stop it. So what the fuck happened? Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've, I've worked with a lot of lovely people and people like Ray McGovern from the CIA, who's former presidential briefer and... Colleen Rowley, who was um, former FBI, and she became Time Person of the Year 2002 because she blew the whistle on the FBI fuck-ups in the run-up to 9-11. Um, and all sorts of other amazingly eminent people and organised tours with them and things like that. So I think it's always useful to peer down the rabbit hole, um, but not dive headfirst into it because there's a lot of nutty stuff out there too. Um, one of my favorite um, irreverent things on YouTube is Juice Media. I don't know if you've ever found it. No, it's, no. It started off as an Aussie juice rap news and it was just spot on all the time with this sort of alternative take, very cynical Aussie rude take on, uh, on how we are being manipulated. And it's only recently the Aussie friends said, actually they've reconstituted their back and they've just done one about the PSYOP of the PSYOP or something. But it's really funny. I'll send you a link after this interview. Yeah, I'll take uh, a look at that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I would 100%. recommend people have a look at Juice Media. <laughs> I can imagine a lot of people asking you as well for different news organisations and outlets. That, But you, you're right. You just, just it should just take everyone's, you know, look at the whole spectrum and, 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 you know, make your own, you know, I think 
we're all adults here, aren't we? We can make our own opinion and not ultimately be fed some information that we think is, um, you know, mm-hmm. is, is the right narrative. On on nine eleven, then obviously, I've got written down here the the security and and liberty sort of pendulum, if you like, that's mm-hmm. that's happened ever since nine eleven. Obviously, the amount of um, and we talked about it just then. You mentioned big, you know, big tech having, um, um, you know, there's there's elements around censorship and there's there's all all sorts of s- s- stuff and people tapping phones and this whole big data big data sort of grab if you like yeah so what 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 are your thoughts on this whole whole situation then so it started in 9 11 and ever since then it's been a effort to get as much data on um people as as, as possible well it started before 9 11 because the um nsa gchq total mastery of the internet plan the evil plan you know he um i think was something from 1999 as far as i remember from the snowden disclosures uh so it was before but it was also seeing them seizing the moment because the dot the first dot-com bubble was you know blossoming at that time yeah um, um and 9-11 was just a very useful pretext when the war on terror was a very useful pretext um but yes the power grab since then is evolving very interestingly and has for a long time so if we're looking at what are the adversaries if if we as a system want to sit on our computer we want to privately um, read or watch dissident information or write and talk to people about their politics or have an active if remote sex life online um, or download music or something like that not necessarily having to pay for it all those sort of things are circumscribed by this big data grab and it's you it's almost always the um the idea of national security that allows that data grab and allows the laws that allow that data grab which is precisely what we saw in the uk with um the investory powers act 2016. have you heard about that one Uh, it rings a bell yeah so this was a law that was um announced in parliament by Theresa may who was then the home secretary um which allows bulk metadata hacking bulk data hacking yeah yeah, 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 and bulk computer hacking so all our computers can be hacked at the stroke of a pen by the Home Secretary or the Foreign Secretary across the entirety of the UK. Yeah, I never even knew that. That is crazy. <laughs> disgusting. What was even more disgusting is that she actually stood up on her hind legs in Parliament and said openly that um, this was legalising what GCHQ had previously been doing illegally since 9-11. So it had always been going on. Yeah, yeah it was always been going on, but now it's legal to do it. Um, and there's a very good organisation called Big Brother Watch, Um, in the UK that tries to track a lot of this stuff and they are very hot at the moment on how Covid um, is being used to um, police us now as well increasingly you know this track and trace going to the police and all that sort of stuff so this big data grab is huge um, and it has been going on for at least 20 years when the intelligence services finally woke up to the fact that actually the internet could be a free thing and that might be bad Um, so they wanted total mastery of the internet and they've pretty much got it along with their cohorts in corporate me uh, corporate tech giants and the criminal hackers have access to it too so i've always said those are the three key threats to our privacy and if you cannot have privacy in what you're doing online and we live a lot of our lives online right you know health stuff finance sex politics whatever it is if we can't protect our online self from outside predators the corporates these state level actors or the criminals how can we guarantee we are private or how can we guarantee that our our online self can be remain in have integrity i think is the best way of putting it remain Mm. safe and that's what we're facing at the moment you had a point now annie where as a very very small silly example when i watch a kind of action movie now i think that would never happen like that that weapon can't fire that way that far you know when you hear a kind of news story or something like COVID, which you mentioned then happening, and you see all of the spinning, you see the politicians and everyone having their say, are you kind of looking at it now from your experience thinking, oh, well, you know, something else is going on, or do you kind of, I don't know, I can imagine you just, you look at things a lot different than maybe me and Tom might. I don't know. I don't, I, it's hard to tell, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I suppose, um, I mean, the whistleblowing stuff stopped, finished uh, 2003, 
Uh, Dave, Shayla and I separated in 2006. And since then I've been um, getting much more involved in sort of hacky, hacktivist, techie type privacy arguments. I was completely a um, technical up to that point, um, which I find fascinating. So I've been swimming in those seas and I've been working, I've had some contact with WikiLeaks over the years, not recently. Um, I work with other whistleblowers for an organization called the Sam Adams Associates, if people are interested in looking that up. There's an award, isn't there? Yeah, there's an award, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that has brought, that's, you know, given me a number of lovely friends within that organization who are other intelligence whistleblowers or military whistleblowers. Um, people like Ray McGovern, Colleen Rowley, I mentioned, Bill Binney, Tom Drake, people like that. Um, and the tech stuff has also taken me into the sort of more ethical side of things, um, looking at the corporate side of things after Snowden. So my most recent um, involvement is with an organization called the World Ethical Data Foundation, where we're trying to bring the ethics back into the data <laughs> rather than, you know, all these predators out there circling us, what can we do? Because if we can't protect ourselves, we're screwed. Um, and we're putting on an event in London, actually, next March, uh, the World Ethical Data Forum, bringing in a lot of different speakers from all these different fields that I know and they know in the corporates, the spooks, the, the whistleblowers, the, all that sort of stuff. Um, it'll be online and just give people a chance to, um, for those speakers sometimes, to talk to each other outside their own bunkers rather than just debating on TV, but actually have a chance to say, this is actually what we're facing, what can we do? And also give an interactive chance to people watching it. Um, to try and break great I think we need to break across these boundaries at the moment you know people get entrenched hey you're a conspiracy theorist you're an ex-spook you can't be one of us you know you're ex-military no we don't agree with you ah you're corporate Ugh, and that sort of stuff and it goes on like this all the time and people never get to sit down and just have a chat and just say well this is my experience and actually you know, I understand your perspective and I have a lot of respect for it and agree with most of it, but there are these little niggles and perhaps we should tease them out and it might help. I literally said that exact point yesterday on, I think, my Instagram. I said, we live in a world where something's either, you know, black or white, you're right or wrong. There's none of this kind of meet in the middle, agreeing to disagree and yeah. maybe taking on each other's point. It's either kind of, you know, with, with the coronavirus at the moment, it's kind of, you've got to read you get one people, it's a complete hoax, let's just crack on, and other people, we're all going to die. There's none of this. <laughs> Actually, do you know what I mean? There might be something in the middle. And yeah, I totally agree. We, we seem to be just so devoid of, of wanting to kind of meet somewhere in the middle. It's just mm. you need one end of the spectrum and that's it. And on well, the, it's on all the... about driving views, isn't it? So the more combative you are, the more views, the more follows you get. And, you know, potentially you might be able to monetize what you're doing. And that is sick in itself, don't you think? I'd rather yeah. have a decent conversation with people and just chew through things, agree, disagree, whatever. But at least you learn that way. Yeah. Mm. And on, on that privacy thing, I think the, the, the one sort of rebuttal that everyone talks about on the privacy thing is, well, if you've got nothing to hide, then, <laughs> you know, then, you know, why, why should you worry? That's such a bullshit. What, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what would you say to those people then, Annie? Because there, there will be people who obviously listen to this that think, yeah, I've got, I've got nothing to add, so why should I worry? Well, um, I would say, would you want someone uh, watching you when you go to the loo for crap? <laughs> would you want someone watching you um, having remote sex with your partner, even if it's consensual, adults and perfectly happy? Because that does happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a, yeah. There was, there was another program exposed by Edward Snowden. It was called Optic Nerve. And apparently 10% of all video conferencing calls across the planet are pornographic like that. 10% so, really that high? Wow. Well, it was back then. I don't know. It might have, it might have flopped a bit since then. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. <to> speak. <laughs> it's lockdown, you never know. Yeah, it could have been, yeah. So um, there are aspects of our, of our lives that we all want private. I mean, be it the hack in Finland about all this mental histories and psychiatric histories of citizens, which has caused a huge stink in Finland over the last week. Who wants to have their psychiatric history put online or up for sale? Um, who wants to have their sex lives watched by the spies in GCHQ in real time, which they were doing with Optic Nerve? Who wants to have their finances looked at all the time? You're not doing anything wrong. You've got nothing to hide, but you want your privacy. Why? What is that trigger? And I would also say as well, flip it back, because what WikiLeaks was trying to do was to impose transparency on the government and provide privacy for the governed. And if the government, of course, wants entire transparency for the governed, the governed people, and they want entire secrecy. That's their optimum position. And all the debates around, you know, how the spies or how the police deal with this stuff or how surveillance can be dealt with come down to that basic question. 
Um, but I would suggest that those in power need to be as transparent as possible. Um, some things need to be kept secret, there's no doubt about it, but not everything. And most secrecy laws are there to protect their embarrassment and their mistakes. Um, and there should be as much privacy and secrecy, so to speak, for the private system. When Snowden went public in 2013, and he revealed this sort of stuff, apparently there was something called the Snowden effect in the UK. Almost 30% of adults stopped or changed their behavior online because they realized they might be being watched in certain ways. So that was a short-lived Snowden effect. Mm. Um, we need more people like Snowden to come up and just make sure people keep realizing this because it's seven years ago. Most people have forgotten what he said. Yeah. And, and we all use these little you know, spy phones in our pockets and we use it to pay for stuff really easily. We use it to watch all sorts of stuff. Um, everything is being spied on. Has it affected your life money in the sense that you maybe don't use a, a smartphone or you don't do certain things or does it affect you in that way or are you just more careful about what you do? It has done. Um, there have been, I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing anything wrong. I've got nothing to hide, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I've, I've always been um, much more careful with my computer. I mean, I use my phone for Zoom and things like that. My phone is just a little corporate whore sitting in my pocket. You know, it can spy on me. It, it can work very happily with all the sort of um, general communication software. Um, and it works very well and it's okay. And that's fine. That's my phone. My computer I'm much more careful about. And also I'm very, I've been using for over a decade now open source software. Um, things like Ubuntu, Linux because there is a, a greater degree of protection from the corporate snooping, the backdooring that Apple would have automatically or Microsoft has had automatically since at least 2006. So Ubuntu is a very good way of at least taking a first step and then starting to use things like um, PGP encryption for your emails, um, Tor for anonymized um, browsing on the internet, Tails for anonymized operating system, um, VPNs, virtual privacy networks, you know, so you can hide where you're actually dialing in from. There's a whole suite of different tools you can use. And depending on how paranoid or less paranoid you are, it's just nice to be able to ensure that you have a certain degree of privacy. I yeah. think. I, I remember seeing there was a photo that um, just obviously just opened to the public and it was a photo of Mark Zuckerberg on his, on his laptop, on his Apple laptop. And he had a piece of, he had a tape over the webcam and a piece of tape over the microphone as well. And um, I was just surprised. I thought the the guy who obviously in charge of Facebook is, you know, is is you know, people would say, well, "What's he trying to hide?" <laughs> Can you see my computer? Ah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there we are. Yeah, it's a good yeah. point, isn't it? Yeah. So I don't use um, tape, and I don't use. I used to use blue tack, but it ruins the lens in case you ever have to use it. So I just sit here with it covered up a little bit. That's interesting. But it just shows your point, you know that. Yeah. And, and for Zuckerberg as well to do something like that and you know to, to... if you know who wouldn't who wouldn't yeah exactly I mean, when, yeah. when Dave and I went on the run across Europe this was 1997 and we knew exactly how they could use exactly the same techniques um you know little lenses uh, turning on your remote your very ancient mobile phone recording device remotely and all that sort of stuff the only difference from then to now is is the speed of the technology because it's the flick of a switch on the internet um that can suddenly make my camera start spying on me, even though it won't show that it's filming, or this one, or my phone to start recording on me. But that it's so easy, just like that. Mm. Whereas in the 90s, it was actually much harder to actuate. You know, uh, going back to that, Annex, I feel it's such a it's such a crazy statement to go on the run, and we never really touched on it. I mean, was there a bit of, you know, <laughs> you're doing something which is, is for the greater good, you know, you and your partner believe you're doing the right thing, you know, and all that, but, was there a bit of, you know, excitement of, wow, we're going on the run, they're going to be after us, they're going to be kind of, wow, it's like Bonnie and Clyde type thing, you know, <laughs> it was a little bit of that about it, or? I have to say at the time, it didn't feel like that, it just felt, I felt sheer fucking terror. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a case of, if we sit here, we are sitting ducks, we will get arrested, there'll be a knock on the door within a day or two, and we'll be taken off to different prisons, and we probably won't see each other for a year, because we held on remand until the trial um if we go on the run uh, we get out of the country we have a fighting chance of staying one step ahead of them and um of dave having the chance to argue his case and try and get the more serious allegations out there because as i said the mail on sunday wussed out 
and only did the subversion stuff. We wanted the Gaddafi plot out of it. So that was our our thinking. Then, of course, we were told, oh, we just ran away. You know, we should have stayed around to, to face the music. But if you face the music, you can't actually sing because you're stuck in prison. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't think it was initially a sort of, hey, we're going on this Bonnie and Clyde. It was virtually, you know, um, it was terror to begin with. And once we'd left the country, it became easier, I think is the best way of putting it. Um, and we were sort of, you know, moving around, staying one step ahead. And that that became easier to think about it as the two of us against the world was the best way we saw it. Was if you were... If, strain on the relationship, sorry. I'm sure, or... I mean, hmm? was, it, was it... Did it put a strain on the relationship? Was it tough being on the run together, knowing that you've, you've tried to do this great thing, to, you know, to to show what was going wrong and yeah, here you are now having your lives turned upside down <laughs> having to be on the run together. It was, it was weird. I mean, we had a very intense and very close relationship. Um, we shared a lot of stuff. So being together like that was actually, that was fun. Yeah, that bit was fun. And we tried to keep it normal. We'd move around, you know, hotel to hotel and all the rest of it. We had, this is back in the 90s, right? We had this a little disc, disc, CD disc players and little speakers yeah. and, you know, you get a candle and a bottle of wine in the hotel room and try and make it as normal as possible, but we had to stay hidden sort of stuff. Um, so it was um, a trial by fire. Being on the run did give some stresses because I was much more par paranoid than Dave. So I'd be sort of flapping around saying, we've got to go now, they might find us. And actually I was right one time, they got as close as two hours to us, so <laughs> which I found out later. I said, come on, we've got to go, we've got to go. So I was the one sort of sorting out all the travel and getting everything um organized and dave was much more sort of laid back about it and, god know. that's crazy so, and so if you were to do that today annie you know would it be a case of just leave the mobile phone um like you'd obviously have to take cash with you you couldn't use an atm it would be all those usual yeah yeah or those little prepaid credit card things yeah. stash them yeah. up and then move yeah but yeah certainly mobile phones be completely verboten um in the couple of years, around the time of the Snowden disclosures and afterwards, I spent quite a bit of time in Berlin, actually. And that's the sort of hub of the hacker scene and the hacktivist scene in Europe. And um, if you went to parties at people's houses, you had to, if you had a phone, you had to put it in a biscuit tin when you arrived and it would get shoved in the um, freezer or the fridge because nobody was allowed to have a phone in case, you know, you were being bugged. <laughs> oh, that's crazy, isn't it? That was a degree of paranoia, but that's Berlin. I mean, it has its own particular history. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. One one thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, uh, I think his name was um, Gareth Williams, the MI6 mm. agent who was a, a mathematician, I believe, wasn't he? And then uh, at, GCH, at GCHQ, yeah. and then and then he moved over to MI6, and his uh, he was found, I believe, in a bag. Was it his? He was found in a bag at a safe house in London, in Pimlico, mm -hmm. if I remember it right. And there was a lot of things that that went on around that. What what are your opinions on on that case then? Jeez, um, that's going back a bit. Uh, I did write quite a lot about it. If people want to have a look at the website, such as animation.ch, it's slightly moribund at the moment, but um, it, I'm coming back and going to be writing soon. Um, but yeah, if you just searched Pimlico, you'd find something about him. Um, from my memory, um, it appears that for some strange reason, the wrong part of the police were assigned to investigate the murder. It was the murder squad rather than the special branch or whatever it's called now, counterterrorism um, group, because the murder squad didn't have access to classified information, whereas the special branch or whatever it's called now would have access and would be the ones who would work with MI6, GCHQ and MI5. So it seemed like they were positioning the police not to be able to investigate properly. And there seemed to be some strange anomalies in the investigation, therefore. And there was evidence that came out of MI6 of hard drives and things like that, like little disks that um, Gareth had in some of his bags in the office or something, which got disappeared. I can't remember the details. I'd have to look it up. But it, it did seem slightly dodgy, should we say. Mm. Um, I don't want to sort of point fingers. In it. I, mean, I just feel sorry for the family because I don't think they're ever going to know the full horror of what happened. All that weird stuff about the cross-dressing. No, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's. I just wondered what your opinion might have been on it. If, 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 um, 
I'll, I'll have a look at what you've what you've written but mm. I um it, it was just it was a weird sort of I always thought it is a CCTV or is it one of those cases where they can't produce all the evidence because it's under certain the official secrets act or I, you know well it's all, it's all this idea as well of um, people trying to contort themselves into a bag and close it and only one person can do it and he was some weird houdini type person so how is gareth williams going to do this you know? yeah. um but yeah i think the main thing that sticks in my mind about that was the the um assignment of the murder that's what a word it was rather than the officers who could go and question mi6 and i do remember as well mi6 being completely obstructed and it was recorded quite openly on the media at the time. So who knows? Mm. Just awful way to go. Mm. I, I remember you had some um, on 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 another on another case, if you don't mind. The, the, I read an interview. Delving through the archive, isn't I it? I know. Yeah, <laughs> I tried to do my research. I really did. Um, is I think you would uh, on the we mentioned about Sergey Skripal and Yulia Skripal before. I think you'd mentioned that there were again some inaccuracies between why the Russians would want to um, poison someone that hasn't even been part of an intelligence agency for a while. I know he was paid by the MI6, I think, but what, what are your thoughts on, on that case as well? Oh, delving back. I mean, that was a, that was a mad um, month, actually, just interview after interview, um, starting with the news night in RT. Um, but yeah, the, well, what I remember, the UK approach didn't stack up. They were supposed to go immediately to the um, Organisation for Prevention of Chemical Weapons, OPCW, um, and they didn't do it. They immediately rushed out and said, hey, it's the Russians. But I think the, the key point was uh, Skripal had been a, an MI6 agent. He'd been a spy. He'd been caught. He'd been put on trial. He'd been convicted by the Russians in 2005 or something. So he would have been absolutely rinsed clean of any information by then. Um, and then he was released as part of a spy swap. You remember the um, American spy um, group in 2010 with Anna Chapman, you know, the glamorous yeah, yeah. redheaded Russian spy. Um, they were swapped for some Western interests and Sergei Skripal was one of them. So he then got a new life in the UK. So he would have gone over to the, he would have been, again, rinsed clean of any any old intelligence information before the Russians would have let him go and then rinse clean with weeks of interrogations by MI6 when he arrived in, in the UK. Then he would have been pensioned off, stuck in his house. Um, they would have kept a sort of monitoring eye on him and that would have been it. So why on earth with Russia after releasing him then decide to assassinate him? It didn't make logical sense you know, to make it a state level assassination and all the rest of it. Then you looked at what he was involved in more recently and he, his handler, um, from MI6 who'd recruited him when he was still in Russia. There's a guy called um, Pablo Miller, um, MI6 handler, who remained his friend, and it's been reported widely, that he also lived in Salisbury and used to meet Sergei Skripal about once a week and you know, keep an eye on him and keep him happy and all the rest of it. That's what you're supposed to do, pastoral care. And then it turned out with the whole Rushgate um, stuff in America, God, this is so convoluted. So, um, <laughs> Pablo Miller was an employee of Orbis Business Intelligence, which is the company founded by Christopher Steele, who was the ex-MI6 officer who pro produced the dirty dossier on Donald Trump. So there would be some speculation at that time, this is going back a couple of years, that um, Pablo Miller, as an Orbis intelligence person, might have talked to Sergei Skripal about Donald Trump and included any sort of hearsay or whatever. Or not, we don't know. Or Sergei Skripal might have been involved in, organ in investigating um, uh, organised crime stuff, as Alexander Litvinenko most famously did before he was assassinated in 2005. So there are all this murky stuff in the background. And a lot of people who come out of the intelligence agencies and you know wash up in other countries will continue to do this. I don't, by the way, I'm much more outspoken. <laughs> but they will continue to have some sort of access. And you know they, they want to feel they've still got a toe in the game and they will do stuff. So it always struck me as completely counterintuitive that Russia, having let him go, would then want to see him punished in a way that would create international odium for Russia at that particular time. It would make much more sense for uh, anyone he might have been looking into, any organized criminals, you know, Ukraine or Russia, whatever it was, to have a pop at him or whatever. Mm. But it, you know, it, it, it's back to the old, you know, who, uh, who benefits? It obviously wasn't Russia from this. 
Yeah, oh, I do that then. I mean, they could have killed him years ago in their cells. It wouldn't have been a biggie. Yeah, other than on... on do you ever, with, with Annie or that, like you say, some people come out of it, but then still keep the toe dipped in the water. Do you, you know, you're here now, you know, trying to fight the good fight about, you know, security and, and all the other amazing things you're doing. But you know, without to sound really negative, is there a point that you think this beast is just too big? It is just too big to, to bring down? Of course it is. Of course it is. Where do you get where do you get the hope from to keep on to keep on the fight? I think I just uh, cussedness. I don't know. I don't know. It is it is the the establishment the the cogs of the machine will always keep grinding on. Um, the only thing that can happen and has happened in history beautifully is sometimes there is um, enough of a, a shift in the direction, even if it's sort of fairly minor, but it turns the tanker in a slightly different way. That can lead to um, different opinions. I mean, we've, we've seen this with uh, universal suffrage. We've seen it with, you know, uh, end of slavery. We see this with identity politics. We see this with a whole range of different areas, if you think about it. Sometimes I get depressed because I think it's, those are the things that are being allowed. And there are other things where we want to change, like, you know, stop the war, from my perspective, stop wars and and um stop you know internet spying give us privacy on the internet where it might be too late but i think as human beings we can't give up we can't stop and just let go and sit back if we feel strongly about these issues it's always worth speaking out and i have to say with my incredibly weird background and tumultuous years i have had not only some terribly frightening times um, and very sad times and troubled times but also I've met some amazing people and had some riotous times too you know coming up with these ideas about how potentially we can change but I always try and remember let's look back uh, how other people other resistance other um, pressure groups have actually succeeded and learn from that rather than thinking we always have to reinvent the wheel and still make the same mistakes thereby so and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm in my 50s now, I'm 52. So I, I can get that sort of perspective back. And some of my campaigning friends are in their 70s or 80s. So that takes me even further back. And then I'm working with these um, youngsters coming through, you know, 20, 30 year olds. And they don't have that backstory, but they have this sort of passionate desire to take it forward. And when they learn this stuff, they ingest it and they, right, okay, we're not going to do it this way, we're going to do this. This is why this is important. So there are so many energized people out there who want to do this sort of stuff and it's just finding that commonality and, and breaking down the barriers and the boundaries and taking it forward which is one of the things i'm doing with as I mentioned the world ethical data forum this is precisely the sort of ethos we're trying to push through and bring all these different age groups as well as different perspectives together to learn and, and take forward and i think that's that's what keeps me going actually Otherwise, I probably would be, you know, jumping off the balcony or something. <laughs> ah, I can't stand this world. <laughs> yeah. I have no intention, by the way. If I'm found jumped off the balcony, it wasn't me. I was pushed. Well, that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, it's 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 um it's it's been a fascinating fascinating conversation, Annie. It really has. Yeah. I mean, to, oh, to, I enjoyed it so much. Thank to, you, you two. <laughs> to, to be honest, you know, I um, you know, I I kind of fall into a camp where. I think similar to what Andy mentioned is, is that on my, it, during my day to day life, you know, none of this I even think about. I don't think about, you know, organizations spying on me. I don't think of like, it just, it just does not cross my, like any th thought process at all. But then when big cases come out like yourself and we have this conversation when other big cases, you know, Snowden and all this, it just, I remember being in, I remember back in 2013, it reignited my thought like, what, why are they do it? You know? And I feel like ever since, you know, I, I, and obviously what's going on with WikiLeaks at the moment and Julian Assange in, in, um, in the embassy and that sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. and, and there's occasional stories around that, but other than that, it kind of flutters away, doesn't it? Until yeah. there's another big story. There's another big wh whistleblower and then it comes to everyone's forefront of mind again. And so it's, um, it's really refreshing for me anyway, personally to have a conversation with you about all this. So I so really do appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, I can always introduce you to other whistleblowers. <laughs> honestly yeah that'd be it'd be really really brilliant yeah 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 it really would no i could uh, through the sam adams network i mean there's there's a few and they're, they're very good and a lot of them are, they're more recent so they're probably more angry than me should we say. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but I think Quite the big reason. one is from, uh, it's funny, we had a guest on um, a few weeks back, um, a conspiracy theorist, and what I think that, I think, obviously speaking to you, you know, very well respected in what you've done, and I, I just find, I know, I know for a fact, if this guy was now speaking to you, his head would be gone. Lincoln out. <laughs> this is why that's happened. That's happened. And I think that's why um, it, it's it's been so great to actually just, rather than like you say, jump down the rabbit hole two feet. I think what you've done really, you've done so well in this chat is just you kind of look into it and just say, look on the edge of it, and this is what's happened, and this is what you're seeing. And I think it's a much more measured way of saying this is what's going on, rather than straight away just you know two feet down it. Mm. it it's really interesting just to. Just to be aware of, of of the problems that are going on on, on in the world, I think is, is and how you've described it all. It's it, it's fascinating, it really is. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Um, Annie, we just got some questions here. If you wouldn't mind just flying through them. Mm-hmm. Um. So, um, I mean, I've got a number here, so I probably won't cover them all. But so, um, Stephen McGill says, which country is the best intelligence agency? <laughs> uh, how do you define best <laughs> well yeah of course yeah um usually i would say probably the israelis because and i know base this only on the sort of view that they scared the us and the uk intelligence agency very good that's not best in as in good that's best as in the most frightening yeah of course yeah um someone says how did the mi5 influence mainstream media we've kind of covered that i suppose haven't we a little bit, yeah. Um, there's some talks on my, my old website um, about, you know, how the, the spies interact with the, the UK media particularly. Um, I used to, I've spoken at investigative journalism conferences all across Europe over the years. And afterwards, I was, I think I'm being a bit out there. I might be sounding a bit conspiracy theorist. And the journalists come up to me after and say, God, that's so true. And it's even worse here. <laughs> <laughs> so if people want to have a look at those, um, they're probably fairly old, but you can find them under the media stuff from 2000. 11 12 13 and then uh, daniel says how do you get into these types of jobs degree wise or degree wise or training obviously you've got classics at cambridge so yeah but i'm ancient that was the old style um and now i think um it's much more egalitarian and i think the new head of mi5 is actually a computer scientist which is the future so it's just basically um I would never discourage anyone from joining any of the agencies. I would always say, you know, they need good young recruits with integrity, but who can keep that integrity, even if it's in the face of some sort of monolithic culture um, and keep questioning it because they need to be questioned. They need to be nudged in the right direction. Mm. Um, and I think tech is probably, you know, the STEM subjects are the way forward. And then um, Joe says, here, has, have you ever encountered a situation whereby there has been a rat or mole from elsewhere who's worked their way into the organisation and is relaying intelligence back to the people? Uh, sorry, in MI5? Yeah. No. And then, and then all the, pretty much all the, others, all the other questions we've covered. I mean, someone mentioned about Edward Snowden, which we've covered in depth. Um, uh, um, Yoga Skripal, we covered um, um, Julian Assange as well. Well, so, yeah. well, Julian Assange to a certain extent. I mean, I would say very, very strongly here that this guy is a publisher. He is an Australian who is in the UK, who is being extradited under the Espionage Act into the USA um, to face 175 years in prison. He is a publisher, pure and simple. If they are going to do that to an Aussie journalist in the UK um, for encouraging a source, to provide information allegedly, then every bloody journalist across the world is equally vulnerable to that sort of predation by the US legislature. If they don't stand up, they don't start fighting for this man, um, they are going to be all at risk and woe to them because they are spineless and craven at the moment. And I, I'm disgusted how they've treated Julian Assange. I will say that very strongly. No, I agree with you. And, and to be honest, I'm surprised there isn't an actual there isn't more of an more of a pressure on journalists like the Guardian with Edward Snowden to 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 um, from government to try and quash these big stories that come out by them, you know, by yeah. by whistleblower. I'm surprised that they haven't tried to cut down on on not necessarily the source, but the you know the the um, communication point. I suppose is a good word to say. But yeah. Mm-hmm. 
it's so funny in the media, isn't it? How you know certain things like that are so big, and there's so much of a spotlight on him, yet so many other things go on and get said, and it's just swept under the carpet as if like nothing's happened. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I think the the media treatment of Julian Assange is absolutely shameless. Shame on them. Mm-hmm. You know, the Guardian and the New York Times particularly have won awards based on the stories that he broke. Mm-hmm. And he's a publisher and he should be treated as a publisher, as the New York Times and the Guardian have been. And they're not doing that. It's... Yeah, yeah. The one no. final one for me, I got to ask, um, is when did kind of being, being on the run end or is it a case of you still? can't come back to England is it you still <laughs> where you go I mean what's kind of life like now oh um well yes I the life on the on the run officially ended in 2000 when Dave and I went back to the UK he knew he was going back to stand trial went on trial got convicted no defense and all the rest of it I have never felt since then since the whistleblowing that I can guarantee my personal privacy I'm not doing anything illegal, all the rest of it, but I've always, you know, and also it goes up and down depending on wh- whom I'm working with. Um, you know, if I were in contact with WikiLeaks a few years ago, up goes the threat model. If I'm not doing that sort of stuff, down goes the threat model, but you can never, never know. Um, so there's always that sort of slight edge, but I really, I've got to the point where I don't give a fuck. <laughs> 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 yeah. Come and get me if you want to. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I'm not doing anything wrong and I do have a lot I want to keep private I think is the best way of putting it that's fair enough thank you so much Annie yeah thank you so, where, where can just, just before we, we dart where can people find and I'm going to write this down for my own personal notes that um, um, event you're doing in March as well oh just it's uh, just worldethicaldata.org and you'll find both the forum and the foundation that way um, and there's an, going to be a ray of amazingly good speakers you know, people from the media people from investive journalism i do distinguish um whistleblowers uh tech guys futurists philosophers whoever it's just going to try and mix it all up and get people talking to each other and, and debating ideas because thinking is sexy right yeah it is of course brilliant thank you so much annie my pleasure thank, thank you, you.